We're starting to make a motion picture of the activities of the library for broadcasting and for school exhibit purposes. Uh, make that as an explanation so you won't think that we're trying to blanket TV this afternoon or anything of the kind. And uh, I hope it uh, doesn't get in your way at all. The uh, board of the Harry S. Truman Library Institute is very proud today to be able to present its speaker. Uh, Governor Harriman has been one of the great public service uh, devotees of our country in our lifetime. It'd be pretty hard to put your hand on a man who served better and longer and in more places of key responsibility. Ellis, who was associated with the Truman Library and friends. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you, and I'm so glad to see so many ladies present. Your interest is of very vital importance. I regret that there's one man that is not here who would have been here if we meeting had been of uh, the board had been taken place which was first set at the end of March, but was interrupted by the tragic death of President Eisenhower, and that is the Chief Justice Warren, who I recall, and I'm sure all of you recall, his making the, his great speech and dedicating this library um, in uh, July 6, 1957. I, uh, Wish we could read that speech every year. I'll only read a couple of sentences from it, but it is an inspiration for me to think that he uh, believed so much in President Truman and his what he meant in American history to make this institution one of his real interests. How he speaks about the museum as the Library and Museum as, as a milestone in American history. He speaks of the Truman era as, he says, is already recognized as one of the most momentous periods in the history of our country and of the world. And then he, uh, he speaks about the importance of the documents that are here all the peoples of this earth may gain by their wide and wise use, understanding of ourselves in our times, and wisdom to choose the right paths in the years that lie ahead. And it does seem to me that uh, when one thinks of President Truman and uh, the man in which he dealt, there's been no president that was more American, there's been no president that has uh, been more forthright in dealing with the issues which he faced. He never ducked them. There are many sayings that are colloquialism that are attached to his name, but one of them which I like, have always liked, is the colloquialism of uh, the expression, the buck stops here. Well, it not only stops there, but he dealt with it. <coughs> And um, I would like to reminisce, if I may, about a few experiences that I've that I had with him. Getting into greater, greater difficulty, and when President Roosevelt died. I felt that it was beholden upon me as ambassador to return and to advise the president, the new president, President Truman, of what had happened so that he would be able to deal with the, the issues which I knew would arise rather rapidly. I thought I would probably have a very long conversation with him, but uh, my talk with him, as all my talks with him when he was president, were always short because no man that I've ever dealt with could deal with so many matters. So
he'd made at Yalta. I found that President Truman had read all the documents and knew some of the documents in even greater detail than I did. Uh, I found that I did not have to. Would not stand for the breaking of agreements that had been reached. This was uh, his quality of reading everything was uh, as uh, as uh, Tom Evans mentioned to the directors at lunch today, uh, I learned that uh, when I worked for him, I had to read everything. I was uh, talk. I went up to him to, when I was there with President Truman to. Uh, and I mentioned to Marshal Stalin that it must be a, I said, must be a great gratification for you to be here in Berlin. He stopped for a moment and said uh, in Russian, Tsar Alexander got to Paris. Well, I didn't need very much more <laughs> to make me, to confirm what had already been my impression, that he had every intention of moving to Paris. And I may say that he would have moved to Paris if it hadn't been for one man. And that was Harry S. Truman. He didn't get Congress to approve so readily and with such a large majority the Marshall Plan, but 20 years later the sad events in Czechoslovakia have aroused the people of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to recognize that together we must continue to work in support of our mutual security and in support of our, of our mutual aims. Well, President Truman's wise foresight lives on. Although well, few people realize, I think, that he uh, appreciated so soon the full extent of the difficulties which we were going to have with the Soviet Union. I remember just a few years ago, there were some rather ardent uh, critics of President Truman that was trying to state that during the winter of 1946, he was what was then called soft on communism. There was a man by the name of White who was in the Treasury who he transferred uh, to the uh, International Monetary Fund, and uh, he did it. Um, he was criticized because uh, White later on was accused of being a fellow traveler, if, if, if not a, a communist himself. But it was in that very week in which that action took that President Truman asked me to come and see him. It had been he had suggested by Jimmy Burns that I go to London as ambassador, and I didn't want to do it. I'd been overseas for five years, and I'd just come home, I wanted to go back to my business and my family. And um, so I marshaled all the reasons that I could think of to explain to President Truman why I wasn't going to go to London. I came into his office, and I can assure you that the talk didn't last as long as I'm describing it. He said, uh, <clears throat> I think he called me Mr. Harriman in those days, which he got over shortly afterwards. Uh, he said, we're going to have trouble with the Soviet Union over Iran, and this may lead to war. I need someone in London that uh, knows the British, and you do. And so my answer rather feebly was, when do you want me to go? <laughs> but that is, um, he didn't make any fuss about it. He instructed our Secretary of State to make a firm, take a firm stand in the United Nations. He instructed me to cooperate with the British.